Professor Dave and Chegg here. We now know a little bit about energy and the first law of thermodynamics in the context of physics. Now let's get back to chemistry and talk about the aspects of thermodynamics that will be relevant to chemical reactions. This will involve a concept called enthalpy, so let's make sure we define this term. The property that chemists will use to describe the thermodynamics of chemical and physical processes is called enthalpy. This is symbolized with a capital H, and it is defined as the sum of a system's internal energy and the product of its pressure and volume, or H equals E plus PV. Internal energy, pressure, and volume are all state functions, so enthalpy will also be a state function. Enthalpy values can't be measured directly. We can only measure enthalpy changes for a particular process. So we can rewrite this more practically as delta H equals delta E plus P delta V, where the uppercase delta means change in. Now, P delta V represents the expansion work done by the system. This expansion work can be represented by negative W, since it is work done by the system, and internal energy can be replaced with Q plus W, as those are equivalent according to the first law of thermodynamics. So we can see that enthalpy can be considered to be the same as heat exchanged when the system remains at constant pressure. This makes sense because usually when we are discussing chemical reactions, unless the products are gas gases that move pistons or some other mechanical situation, we usually are just doing chemistry in solution, which doesn't result in a change in pressure or volume. So long story short, we can typically think of change in enthalpy as the change in energy for the system, which will just refer to heat absorbed or released. We will use thermochemical equations to list enthalpy data for a given chemical reaction. These are just chemical equations with a delta H value listed. If delta H is negative, the reaction is said to be exothermic, and that quantity of heat energy is released. If delta H is positive, the reaction is said to be endothermic, and that quantity of heat energy must be absorbed in order for the reaction to occur. The heat capacity of an object refers to the energy required to raise the temperature of the object by one degree, or the energy released when its temperature is reduced by one degree. Heat capacity will vary according to the composition of the object, because different substances absorb and release heat at different rates, due to differences in structure and composition, a fact that we make use of in designing different materials. Heat capacity will also depend on the amount of the substance present, because the more of it there is, the more heat it will have to absorb to raise its temperature uniformly. A glass of water will heat up much more quickly than a swimming pool, because there is so much less matter for the heat energy to be distributed within. The heat capacity for an object can be calculated by the following equation, where Q equals heat, and delta T equals the change in temperature of the object. This will give us a value in joules per degree Celsius, or the energy required per degree of temperature change. For example, let's compare two cast iron frying pans. They are made of identical material, but one is five times larger. Therefore, the larger one will have a much larger heat capacity, because there is so much more matter that needs to receive sufficient heat energy so as to raise its temperature. Let's say it takes 18,150 joules of energy to raise the temperature of the small pan by 50 degrees, and it takes 90,700 joules of energy to raise the temperature of the large pan by 50 degrees. What will be the heat capacity of each pan? Plugging in these values, we should get 363 joules per degree Celsius for the small one, and 1,814 joules per degree Celsius for the large one, which, as we would expect, is right around five times the other one. Whereas the heat capacity of an object depends on the amount of matter in the object, we want a way to describe heat capacity that is independent of the amount of matter, so that we can describe a particular substance in a general way. This will be called the specific heat capacity, or simply specific heat, and it refers to the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. This means that the two cast iron frying pans of different sizes that had different heat capacities will actually actually have identical, specific heats, because they are made of the same material. This means that whereas heat capacity is an extensive property, depending on the amount of substance present, specific heat is an intensive property, and does not depend on the amount of substance present. Iron will heat at a particular rate per gram, regardless of how much there is.
The specific heat of an object can be calculated similarly to heat capacity, but this time with an additional term for mass. We will need to divide the heat exchanged not just by the temperature change, but also by the number of grams of the substance present to get a value that represents joules per gram degree Celsius. Here are the specific heats of various substances. Notice that liquid water has a very high specific heat. Most metals, on the other hand, have rather low specific heats, along with a few gases. If we know the specific heat of a material, we can calculate the amount of heat exchanged during a process by measuring the mass and temperature change during the process. This requires a simple rearrangement of the original equation to give heat exchanged equaling the specific heat times mass times the change in temperature, or the final temperature minus the initial temperature. If the temperature goes up, it will have absorbed heat, and Q should be positive. If temperature goes down, it will have released heat, and Q should be negative. Let's see if we can calculate the specific heat of a substance. A piece of unknown metal weighs 348 grams. After absorbing 6.64 kilojoules of heat, its temperature went from 22.4 to 43.6 degrees Celsius. What is the specific heat, and what substance is it likely to be? Let's use our equation for specific heat and plug in all the known values. We should get an answer of 0.9 joules per gram degree Celsius. Looking back at our table of specific heats, it seems likely that this sample must be a piece of aluminum. So specific heat data is very useful for identifying unknown substances. Now let's examine an important application of this concept. To do experiments in thermal chemistry, we will need techniques that can measure the amount of heat transferred to or from an object so that we can do calculations. One way of doing this is called calorimetry. A calorimeter is a calibrated device that can measure the amount of heat involved in a physical or chemical process by combining temperature data with a known heat capacity for the device. This can be very useful data if we also know some information about the masses of substances involved and other aspects of either the system, which refers to the substance or substances undergoing the chemical or physical change, or its surroundings, which refers to the other components of the measuring apparatus that serve to either provide heat to the system or absorb heat from the system, depending on whether it's an exothermic or endothermic process. Many times calorimeters are just well-insulated containers that can directly measure a temperature change due to a physical or chemical process, without letting heat escape to the environment surrounding the calorimeter. This would mean that all of the heat released by a reaction would go directly towards heating up the calorimeter, or the heat absorbed by a reaction would come directly from the calorimeter, thus enabling a direct measurement of this temperature change with minimal error. This is often reproduced in a rough way with a coffee cup calorimeter, since styrofoam is a pretty good insulator. This will not give results quite as precise as a more expensive industrial apparatus, but it is fairly reasonable and easy to set up. Something that can be done with a simple calorimeter would be to measure the heat capacity of an unknown object. A piece of metal could be heated to a known temperature, perhaps in boiling water, and then transferred to a known volume of room temperature water in a calorimeter, which will then heat up to an intermediate temperature somewhere in between the two initial temperatures. By measuring the temperature change of the water as the hot metal transfers heat into the water, we can measure the amount of heat transferred into the water since we also know the mass of the water given its volume, as well as the specific heat of water. Specific heat, mass, and change in temperature is everything we need to solve for Q in this equation for water. We also know from conservation of energy that there can have been no loss of heat during this transfer. In other words, Q water, the heat absorbed by the water, plus Q metal, the heat released by the metal, equals zero. If we subtract Q metal from both sides, we get Q water equals negative Q metal, which represents the reasonable assumption that all of the heat involved in the process went directly from the metal to the water, losing only a negligible amount to the environment. Therefore, in calculating the heat absorbed by the water in the calorimeter, we will also learn the amount of heat that was released from the metal, which is simply the negative version of Q for the water. With this information, we can plug values into a new equation, but this time using values for the metal. The Q value will be the Q metal we just got from our calculation for water, but this time the mass will be the mass of the metal, and the change in temperature will go from the initial temperature of the hot metal to the final temperature in the calorimeter. The delta T will therefore be negative this time, which makes sense as it will cancel out the negative in the Q value. The only unknown is the specific heat, so we can then solve for it. Once we add the specific heat, we can hopefully identify the composition of the unknown metal. Let's get a little more mathematical with this. 
For example, let's say a 59.7 gram piece of metal submerged in boiling water is transferred into 60 milliliters of water initially at 22 degrees Celsius. The temperature of the water is raised to 28.5 degrees as a result of the heat transfer. What is the specific heat of the metal? Just as we discussed, let's first use the given data to figure out the heat absorbed by the water using this equation. Since water is 1 gram per milliliter, it's easy to get the mass of the water. The specific heat of water is a known value that is always the same, and we know the initial and final temperature of the water, so let's plug those values into the equation. We should get 1,632 joules, which is the heat absorbed by the water. Let's also recall that the heat absorbed by the water must be the heat released by the metal, so Q metal must be negative 1,632 joules, since a positive Q means heat absorbed, and a negative Q means heat released. So let's write a new equation using the Q metal we just calculated. This time we have the mass of the unknown metal and the temperature change experienced by the metal, and the only unknown will be the specific heat of the metal. Doing the math, we should get 0.382 joules per gram degree Celsius as the specific heat of the metal. If we take a look at our list of specific heats, we might notice that the tabulated specific heat for copper is extremely close to the value we just calculated for our unknown metal, making it very likely that this was a piece of copper. With that, we should have a reasonable understanding of enthalpy, heat capacity, specific heat, and calorimetry, as well as the utility of these concepts. Professor Dave for Chegg. See you next time.